Good evening, everyone. Um, the mayor could not be here this evening. He's out traveling outside of the city, so I will be filling in. Uh, if you would please join me in saluting the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic from which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, we start off our meeting with the hearing of visitors. I believe we have so far two people. We have um, Natalie Pohl. Natalie. Good evening. Um, the hearing of visitors is three minutes. The school committee and superintendent uh, will listen to the presentations but um, we take everything under advisement and we do not get into a running dialogue as you well know so um, the floor is yours Ms. Pohl. Thank you. Good evening Superintendent Smith and members of school committee. Uh, my name is Natalie Pohl and I'm the principal of the Barrett Russell School. I want to speak tonight on behalf of all the uh, excuse me all the Brockton Public Schools employees who remain laid off due to the current budget crisis. Every single one of these dedicated professionals is critical to our school system and is a devastating loss. This especially hits our school hard as our administrative assistant, Shoal Marion, is one of those employees who are currently not returning to us this fall. As a newly reopened school this past year, we needed to overcome a neighborhood reputation that was less than desirable. Mrs. Marion is one of the major reasons why we have turned that reputation around and families are excited to be part of the Barrett Russell School community. Mrs. Marion is the heart and soul of our school. She is the first person you meet when you walk through our doors. She knows every parent, every family, every child's name. Her warm tone ensures that everyone feels welcomed and every parent feels safe and feels that their child is in a place that truly cares about them. I can think back to my own elementary school days and remember our school secretary, Mrs. Fitzgerald. If you were chosen to be the office messenger that week, she, was, she would always have a special prize in her desk for you. Nothing big, a sticker or a pencil, but everyone couldn't wait to be chosen. It wasn't the prize that mattered. It was that little recognition that she would give every student, a feeling of being special. These are the things that matter. These are the people that leave those indelible marks upon our lives. Mrs. Marion is one of those people. Every single staff member, from teachers to administrative assistants to custodians, is vital to the success of our learning community. Without each and every one of them, it is the children and families we serve who will be losing out. I know that everyone is working hard on this. We have been able to recall all of our certified staff and some additional staff members. But there is still more work to be done until we are able to bring back every single school employee. I urge you to bring back Mrs. Shoal Marion, our administrative assistant, so that she can continue to make her mark on the lives of our youngest students in the City of Champions. Um, next on the list is Mr. Mark Zaid. Hello, Mark. Good evening, Mr. Minicello. Good How evening, Superintendent and committee members. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Um, I'm a 24-year resident of the city of Brockton. I currently have a five-year-old son that attends the Gilmore School, who just actually graduated and should be attending kindergarten this fall. If the administration office can get the paperwork squared away. That's one of the issues I would like to discuss this evening, but my son just started the summer program at the Gilmore, which began yesterday, and an ongoing issue with transportation, with the van service, that we've been dealing with for the past two years. Okay, the bus never showed up yesterday. I spoke to uh, Mr. Thomas downtown, I spoke to the special ed office and the secretary, the teacher, the head teacher at the Gilmore program. My son was on the list for the bus. The bus just never showed up. Did not make it, didn't bother come to our house. A friend of ours who also attends the same program, the bus didn't bother to pick him up either. Okay, this has been going on for two years with issues with this 
transportation company. My son weighs 31 pounds, okay? He needs to be in a car seat. We've had substitute vans show up with no car seat. The beginning of the last school year, I provided a car seat in the van for about three months because the bus company did not have a car seat available. I find that to be a huge problem. Okay. Other issues we've encountered over the last two years with busing, with the van service, is substitute drivers. Uh, the driver we had this year was a fa very nice woman, very professional, kind, very nice lady. But she had some personal issues and she was out a few times here and there for medical reasons. And the substitute drivers would be at least an hour late. Talk to the transportation company while well, we have to call them in. My understanding is that they're supposed to have substitute drivers at the yards to eliminate this. Well, it has not been the case for the past two years. Something needs to be done. These people need to be held accountable. I know the city pays an awful lot of money to this bus company to provide services. And the city, to me, as a taxpayer and a resident, seems that we're not getting what we pay for. That's on that issue. Second issue is paperwork confusion. Currently, my son is not enrolled in a kindergarten program for the fall. They tell us they don't have a place for him because we were late with the paperwork. We submitted all the paperwork that was sent home from the school back to the school. Got a phone call, have to come downtown, fill out paperwork. So I did. Okay, I thought maybe we screwed up. The only paperwork missing was a language survey. That should not be an issue to hold up assigning a child to a kindergarten class. So as of graduation last week or two weeks ago at the Gilmore School, my son is not assigned to a kindergarten for the fall. That's a big issue. Okay. Um, I spoke to Mr. Thomas. He was very quick on calling me back. Very greatly appreciated. Told me that the director of the special ed would be calling me. Still have not heard from that person since yesterday. Seems like people just don't care. A lot of them do. Some of the administrative staff, it seems, do not. I think that's an issue. Okay, and lastly, uh, before, on my way over, my niece called me and asked me to bring something up. She attends the Hancock School. About the conditions over there, there are no latches that work on any of the bathroom stalls. My niece is in the f going into the fifth grade. She cannot use a restroom because she's afraid because there are no latches. She also tells me there's never any toilet paper or soap in the dispensers. We all pay a lot of money. The school program is a fantastic system. There's no question on that. But for bathroom latches not to be on the stalls, I looked last fall when I voted. There were no latches that were working on any of the toilet petitions. Something should be addressed on that. Here's a 10-year-old girl, 9-year-old, I'm not even somewhere in that neighborhood. She cannot use a restroom in the building. I think something, it's an easy fix. We're not talking replacing everything. It seems that they could be fixed and repaired very easily. Thank you very much for your time. Zaid, we will address those concerns and someone will get back to you. Uh, yes, Mr. Zaid, if not, um, can you talk to Donna McDale? We'll take your information and we'll get back to you very quickly. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I believe his information's on the hearing of visitor sheet, right? Is there a phone number there? Uh, you we spoke yesterday. Okay. All right. Great. We'll take care of that. Okay. Oh, it's right in front of me. Okay. Pass that over to Donna. All right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Those are the routine items up for approval at this time. The school committee, uh, a school committee member or members can choose to withdraw an item for further discussion. At this time, is there any item that a member would like to withdraw and further discuss separately? Okay, seeing none, may I have? To accept the consent agenda as it stands? Sure. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is communication report of superintendent of schools. <coughs> superintendent Smith. Thank you. It's so good to see all of you again. It, it feels like uh, it's been forever. <laughs> um, 
tonight uh, we'll start with, we have a couple of presentations uh, we're very excited to present to you. So first I will invite up um, Karen Watkins Watts from our grants office and her team and they will present to you uh, the Carol White grant, the PEP grant, which we've of course been speaking about during our present budget situation and uh, Karen will be able to talk about the uh, purpose of the grant and how we're moving forward with it. Uh, we're pleased to present um, our uh, recent award of the Carol White Physical Education um, Program grants from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, we'll get started right away here. Um, we actually applied for this grant, give you a little background, uh, in April of 2013. We were actually an FY13 um, uh, applicants for this program through the Office of Safe and Healthy Students and um, we were not on the initial list of uh, awardees but we learned um, just this past April that we were uh, what they call funded down the slate uh, meaning we weren't they were not having an FY14 competition but because of our uh, program scoring so highly we were able to um, uh, be a, among the awardees for FY14. So the, the, the team, of course, includes, let me just introduce us, uh, myself, um, Mr. Peter Caruso, who's our coordinator of physical education and athletics, K-8, to Mary Ellen Corain, department head of wellness, K-8, to um, Mr. Tom Burke with um, Chartwell's Food Service, and um, Jane Froley, our parent engagement specialist. Okay. So the overview, the Carol White, didn't mean for it to animate this way, anyway. The Carol White grant is um, to um, school districts, local education agencies, to initiate, expand, or enhance physical education programs so in order to meet state physical education standards. So that's the key there. Um, when I presented this grant to our team, uh, and we worked pretty tirelessly for, what, a couple of months to get this proposal submitted, um, we knew that we checked off quite a few of the boxes in terms of the priorities that were outlined by the Department of Education. Uh, one was this competitive preference priority one, and these mean these priorities mean you get extra points for your application, uh, meaning that we had um, uh, schools in the categ their categorization of persistently lowest achieving uh, among Northwest and BB Russell. Um, then competitive preference priority two partnerships. Um, we chose to partner, of course, with our, our city, uh, Brock, uh, Brockton Mayor, uh, Mass Department of Public Health, the Old Colony Y, and Chartwells. And then uh, we met what they call seven design filters. Universal access, meaning providing access to the programming for our ELL and our SPED students. Um, age appropriate activities, that's for grade six to eight um, students. Um, guidelines on dosage and duration, well-trained um, coaches and mentors. That's gonna be our, our seven new physical education teachers. We're gonna track progress for our students individually and in groups through a new software program called Fitnessgram, and Peter will share more with you about that. And then consistent motivation and incentives throughout the program. Um, and then, last but not least, um, we met what they call Invitational Priority 2, meaning um, East Middle School was on their list of priority schools. So, we had to work to develop Wordsmith, um, a compelling program need, and we found that um, among our um, middle and alternative school students. Uh, we were um, allowed to select schools K to 12, but our middle and alternative school students, they basically uh, met quite a few of the, of the uh, priorities. So um, we, we knew we had no teacher at the B.B. Russell, no PE teacher rather, um, and then our, our P, a student to PE teacher ratio was pretty high at 525 to 1. Um, and then we knew there was a substantial gap in terms of the amount of time that students are allowed to spend in physical education with the, with the federal, uh, what they call Government Grantee Performance Reporting Act, uh, the NAPSI standard, and the School Health Index. And then um, 
on the um, nutrition side, we had done, uh, Mary Ellen facilitated in, in 2012 a youth risk behavior so survey that um, was able to help us articulate our need for nutrition education. Uh, so two thirds of our students um, from that survey said that they do not eat vegetables three or more times a day. <laughs> And then 26% uh, a little over a quarter of them don't, do not consume fruit or 100% juice two or more times a day. And that is their standard. That is the um, Government Performance Reporting Act standard for this grant. And we knew from the USDA Food Access research that there were food deserts among our target schools. And food deserts are low-income census tracts with um, low access to large supermarkets um, where you can get your fresh, affordable foods. So um, in terms of our, what, what we were um, proposing in terms of Brockton Gets Youth Moving, that's how we named our program, that we knew we were going to address some epidemic rates of um, overweight and obesity. Uh, we knew that there had been some surveys, BMI surveys, that show we exceeded some of the federal rates in terms of overweight and obesity. Um, we knew that, you know, of course, sedentary lifestyles, poor eating habits lead to those things. And um, so we were targeting all of our adolescents in grades six to eight. Um, our award amount was $1.75 million. We applied for $2.1 million, um, but a big portion of that was a school breakfast program that we proposed that the, the feds, the, I guess I shouldn't say feds, <laughs> The Office of Safe and Healthy Students, they disallowed that. Um, so we, are, we have a three-year grant. It started May 1st. It's already started. And um, so we're feverishly trying to get our teachers hired. Um, uh, so our objectives are, are threefold. Um, Age-appropriate physical education and activity. Uh, we're trying to meet a goal of 60 minutes per day. Um, and that's meeting with the President's Youth Fitness Program, Healthy Fitness Zones. And Peter will share more with you about that. Um, and then on the nutrition side, um, we're going to be doing research-based nutrition education, which Mary Ellen will share more with you about, to meet our um, fruit and vegetable consumption goals. And then third, um, which is a part of our program design, was to engage and educate our parents and families um, through our Parents Academy. And um, uh, Mary Ellen will share more with you about that as well. Okay. So here's our first objective. Sure. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for having us here. Um, I would like to go over a little bit about why this came about and how we plan to implement this and why I feel and our department feels that this is important for this age group at this point in time. In our curriculum, uh, we used a couple tools to survey how effective our curriculum was meeting the needs of these particular middle school students. Um, I, to be self-critical of our own curriculum, it only helps us in the long run. It identified the fact that we do not make significant gains in the fitness levels of the particular students we now have. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that, but this grant was intended to see if we could boast up our curriculum and add to what we already had. Our skill development and game part of our curriculum is fine. This was the area that we needed to bolster. So we plan to be able to institute through this grant a tool that we can measure and have online data, which is the old presidential fitness gram, is what it used to be. And now they've refined it so that we can get instantaneous zones. We've always used this, but we've never been able to upgrade it to today's technology for a variety of reasons also. So between that and then being able to institute with another physical education teacher that will basically deal with the fitness area of these students alone plus after school activities and before school where we can actually bombard for about 20 weeks out of the year that they will get part of their phys ed curriculum designed toward their fitness level hopefully we should be able to make an improvement in that area why is it important middle school body image uh, lack of motivation uh, 
not being able to participate, be of worrying about what other people think and see about them. That's a that's that's a major issue for us. We don't have that much problem at the elementary level, but at the middle school level, that's where we really need to focus to at least give them the tools to be able to reshape or choose what they would like to do and then go on hopefully for the rest of their life from there. And uh, that's the whole premise of this whole grant and that's how we came about zeroing in on this factor. Um, we do a pretty good job as it is, but as of right now, because of the length of the school year, we see them about 42 weeks out of the year. Uh, between following the other skill development, we can only really devote about two and a half to three weeks most dealing in this area. And then we leave it to themselves to pick it up on their own, of which most of them do not do that. The beauty of our program also now is, is that it will also monitor through pedometers and some other tools that we have their fitness level after school hours, on weekends, so we can get a real true idea to report back to the government exactly what they're engaging in and what they are not engaging in. And then we should be able to tailor programs and hopefully move forward from there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with the bike program? No, no, so did you want to No, I'm, okay. I'll answer any questions okay. anybody has. Okay, we can wait to the end. All right. We'll be in. Okay, okay. So they lose your... Mm -hmm. The way that the organizational chart for my particular area would be is, of course, the teachers that we're going to add, we, have, we presently have one in each middle school. This will give us two. And with the addition of the B.B. Russell, we will have 6.5 new positions. And that's just the hierarchy of how it would break down, that they would be in my department. And of course, they have to adhere to all the building rules and regulations of the principal and everything within the school. But this is how it would break down. So we would have two in all our middle schools. In the alternative, B.B. Russell, which now has nothing, absolutely zero. We just never had a staff to be able to um, service that population. And they have a middle school population over at the alternative over there. We just couldn't service them. Oh, you're going to talk now? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Good evening. Um, as Carol said, there are two main priorities to this grant, one being physical activity and bolstering our PE program. Another piece is uh, looking at what we're doing in terms of health education. And we have always used uh, research-based nutrition education, and we partner with the UMass Extension right now in the sixth grade to have those um, staff work with the health educa educators from the Brockton Public Schools and present the coordinated approach to child health which is called the Catch Life in the Balance curriculum. So this grant has afforded us the opportunity to expand that into the 7th and 8th grade. And that will be for all middle school students. So that's going to strengthen, this grant is going to help us strengthen this um, collaborative even further. Um, an exciting piece that's going to be added to nu the nutrition education, and we've already had... Um, people talking to us and, and offering their um, their expertise in cooking and, and healthy healthy eating after school programs, um, we will be able to have, like the bike program, an after school program where students who are interested in um, you know, nutrition and cooking and we know a lot of kids um, start to make their own lunches, decide on their own breakfasts um, and sometimes even will take care of cooking at home for their families at this age. We're, we're hoping and we're looking at using a uh, research-based after-school nutrition program. So that's an exciting event, and that will be at all the schools. Um, a third priority that has been a priority of our department, um, and not just the K-8, to but, but also the high school health teachers, is to, when we did our HECAT, similar to what Peter did, which is the PCAT, when we did the assessment, we, we have always wanted to take the time to 
focus in on how can we um, better service um, our ELL students and our special ed students. We know that um, we do a great job in our learning objectives and our performance tasks in the health in the health classes, but it's always been a struggle of taking the time and finding the right tools to use that term universal access and do a better job with with what we do. So we have a partnership with Cambridge College and um, back when we submitted the grant, um, luckily we had some time. Um, I'm a, an adjunct uh, teacher there, and so I wrote a course called Health Education Pedagogy for Culturally Diverse Populations, and it was approved by Cambridge College, and Brockton has been um, decided that, the, Cambridge has decided that we can be a site where we can satellite, and again, we have a previous collaborative with Cambridge through, through other instructors in the system, but we will be a site where this course uh, will be offered to our teachers um, and um, you know Cambridge is very happy that we went ahead and, and did something as well um, because it is a need throughout the the system um, throughout the state in on this particular topic so that's that's something that will be um, an opportunity for all the health teachers um, in the district um, the piece that um, Jane will be working with is to um, engage and educate the families and uh, the parents and the families. And this was, as Karen said, this was a, a cherry on top of the Sunday that we added to the grant application because we have such a strong parent academy, we have such a strong parent outreach um, program that we threw this into the grant and really felt that we got a lot of extra points um, for this piece. And we know that middle school students and middle school parents um, don't always want to show up together at functions. <laughs> it's just the nature of the, the age. Um, but we've had some success this year at piloting some of these workshops. And we know that fitness, Zumba, and healthy cooking are topics that um, middle school kids don't mind going to with their parents. So Jane crafted um, a parents academy and we will run these workshops starting in this year. And what will do is each one of the middle schools will host and then all the others will be invited to um, either a fitness a Zumba or a healthy cooking workshop um, she has developed a or is going to be developing newsletter it will probably be a digital newsletter because we know that paper newsletters don't necessarily make it in backpacks nor will they make it home with middle schoolers so she's going to be creative and inventive um, and we will hopefully work with the parents liaisons as they come back um, to our system to continue to help us support this component um, because we know that they're vital to making it, it happen and uh, we're confident that we will be able to um, fill in the blanks until they all come back but we will we will move forward with that and and um, and we see that as a really strong piece to the grant um, Okay, thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, so, but last and la last but not least is um, our how are we going to um, communicate our success of this program, um, and we'll do that um, within aligned with the the federal government's grantee performance results act measures. Um, first of all, of course, we're going to be measuring. Um, uh, the percentage of students who engage in that 60 minutes of physical act activity um, and as prescribed by the Office of Safety and Healthy Students we will do that by pedometers and what they call a three-day physical activity recall instrument um, and of course we'll be um, using um, our new um, fitness gram software that Peter just mentioned to help us to uh, track and measure the percentage of students who meet that healthy fitness zone in at least uh, five of the six fitness areas. And then um, also, uh, finally the percentage of students who consume the fruit and vegetables as we'd like. Um, and we'll do that um, with um, uh, pre and post surveys that the University of Massachusetts Nutrition Education Program will conduct. Um, what we'll do is make sure that they ask those same nutrition related questions that we already had in our youth risk behavior survey. They'll ask those same questions and hopefully we'll be able to gauge um, uh, pre and post um, those um, 
those measures. Now, this, the, the government's going to, we just uh, uh, completed a webinar the other, what, last week, uh, two weeks ago, um, with them, and they will ask us to uh, submit data. Uh, this will be a very strongly data-driven program where they'll ask us to submit data three times this first year um, and two times um, in years three, two and three. So um, we'll, um, we'll meet those standards. We're excited about the program, um, and we welcome any questions that you have about um, about the grant. Thank you. Comments are both from the committee. Um, nice presentation. I think that um, obviously the more uh, physical activity that our young people do besides doing this all the time um, it will be beneficial uh, I know I guess two questions uh, it seems that uh, you know time during the day is precious with respect to the curriculum um, uh, math English science um, how do you plan to incorporate more time or um, you know utilize the assets of this grant uh, in terms of implementation time-wise in the day and two um, I noticed that you have a component with respect to parent liaisons could you ex please explain how that this grant incorporates those positions uh, into uh, bringing them into an existence or back uh, on the uh, it, well, within I'll our schools to the activity piece but the you know part of our program design and you know, Peter's expert he's a designer is you know we plan on having um, school day well before school school day and after school additional components of activity um, and that of course includes the CrossFit curriculum that'll be during the school day and I know you hope to incorporate CrossFit into the intramural program as well mm -hmm. you do want to say something about that? sorry I can talk yeah um, okay sure mm -hmm. it will not have to adjust the school day for the principals or won't interfere with their ability to you know take away from other classroom time or activities or whatever what will happen is let's uh, stay for an instance uh, a class uh, period on day a period one 50 kids are scheduled to come to the gym to take physical education at that time at the very beginning of the year that class will be split in half so one teacher will have 25 and then the other teacher will have 25 one teacher will be able to do all the skills games parts of our component the other physical education teacher will do the crossfit so they will get that intensive um, physical activity component that we weren't able to provide before <clears throat> and every 10 weeks for motivational reasons or whatever will flip so the ones that were in crossfit will do these skills so they won't lose out on any part of our curriculum then at the next quarter, the end of the third quarter, they will flip again. So the class size will not change and nothing will change in the schedule. It's just the intensity and the diversity of the program of how we will deliver this. So they'll end up getting 20 weeks of skill and game development as well as 20 weeks of the CrossFit and fitness component. And uh, the second part of that was the parent liaison oh, the parent uh, component? Well, when we submitted the grant, as Karen said, everyone was in place and they were an integral part. Um, we've had several meetings as a, as a team to look at um, different strategies to deliver the same objectives that we brought forward. Um, I've talked to, we've talked to Jane about um, if we aren't able to secure back the, the parent liaisons using obviously the wellness teams that are in every building as, as advocates for Parent Academy. Um, we work closely with Jocelyn on um, uh, Robo, uh, it's not RoboCop, but the, the, the E, the, the phone calls. Yeah. Um, it, Jane has a whole uh, list of already started of emails. Every parent that comes to a parent program, she takes their email. So each school has a database, so to speak, and we would try to use, obviously, our staffs, the health and the PE teachers to gain more of that information. 
and should we not be able to have a person at, at the school. Um, it's, it's not going to be what it was intended to until, uh, until we can get some of these back, but we have already talked about the worst case scenario of how will we still deliver on the grant and make things happen um, until we can, we can figure out getting them back. Great. Um, I would suggest that you um, return to the committee uh, after the first quarter of the year to basically inform us of how it's going and sure. how it's being you know implemented so that we okay. can understand you know how you've incorporated it more thoroughly sure. and obviously trial by error I'm sure there'll be some adjustments and tweaks yeah, yeah. so um, but I, th I think you know it's, it sounds good uh, anyone else Mr. Robinson? Um, interested in, you listed all those partners at the beginning mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and didn't really talk about their role or if they have a role. I assume Chartwells will be involved in some of the healthy eating initiatives, but mm -hmm. the YMCA, DPH, others, will they be actively involved at all or are there resources that they bring to the table? Well, at the time that we wrote the grant, we were working with the uh, Mass in Motion folks at, on the okay. mayor side. And so I'm not sure what's left to that program, but we will re obviously reach out to that. There was the gardening and the, um, yep. and that component. Um, as far as um, the the why, they have already partnered with Jane in terms of providing the parent engagement um, programs for for the parents. So it's those kinds of those kinds of partnerships that we're looking for. Um, UMass has stepped up to the plate in terms of doing our survey. They already did a pre and post survey through the initiative we already had and they do all the tabulating for us uh, and for, for themselves um, in the sixth grade and they offered to do um, the whole shebang for us, the whole six, seven, and eight. And as Karen said, those, those questions that they already asked were the exact same ones we were asking on the YRBS. So because we have such a strict reporting and it has to be, as Karen said, three times, this is going to be monumental to have um, them and it doesn't cost the grant or the school system anything because it's a partnership so that that was a huge piece on on my end to have somebody else be able to do that data collection Great. and how is this being connected into some of other uh, some of our other healthy initiatives things like the walking school bus safe routes to school um, well the bike know. program the bike program which was unique is is an offshoot of the walk on Wednesday and the walk to school at the middle school we advocate for for the kids to ride their bikes we know that a lot of kids do uh, we partnered with the city and got bike racks this year at South and Asheville already up and running so this will be an opportunity for say someone at a school um, who is interested in biking to run that bike program and mass safe routes will come down and do a training with those advisors and and kids will learn how to take care of their own bike. There'll be a nice bike rack to safe right in front of the principal's window to lock it up. Um, we have 20 bikes that we'll be able to buy and helmets and locks for those kids interested. And again, that will increase their um, fitness activity during, during so the day. So we expect that there'll be an increase in participation. We hope that there'll be oh, an yeah. increase in participation yeah. in those right. programs. That's the goal. And they're, right. Right. they're built in. Right. Um, right. And I, I imagine maybe the intramurals program as well, given... Yes. Uh, so what we would like to do is part of the grant will allow us to institute there are a lot of students that show up in the morning <coughs> if you drive by some of the middle schools the ones by my house the uh, students get out of the house they've been at you know some of them are at the school as early as seven o'clock in the morning so to do something productive and give them an opportunity to engage in something we thought it would be good to push forward with not only a traditional after-school program that we have for intramurals, but the uh, morning one also. And in the morning one, we would like to concentrate more on the fitness thing and then let the afternoon be the traditional games and the other things that we usually do in the afternoon. So hopefully between the whole approach, we should bombard them more than what they normally receive as of the present time and hopefully something will develop from there on, hopefully. And, and what about the, um, <clears throat> I know one of the healthy eating initiatives or one of the food initiatives that we've instituted as a district is like the breakfast in the classroom mm -hmm. in the yes. elementary yep, right. schools, mm -hmm. the grab and go participation at the middle schools hasn't always been great. Um, 
probably a yeah. big reason why the kids aren't getting as much fruit juice right. or vegetables. Right. That was should, a big just quote. because they don't uh, yeah. participate. That was a big part of our need statement was the fact that there was you know, breakfast participation needed to be boosted. And we actually had initially asked for a breakfast, funding for breakfast. But, you know, as the face would have it and, and hard work from Mary Ellen, we you know we were able to get some other right. funding for that. So yeah. And we do yeah. have a lot of participants. Mm -hmm. We have um, we have Ashfield and Plouffe right now offering grab and go. So if the students say come early and they go to the CrossFit in the morning, um, there are there's an ex expansion grant to to make it so that there's actually kiosks at, at specific um, corridors. So when the kids come in, they can grab breakfast if it's you know right right time yeah. to go to homeroom, um, and they can't even make it to the cafeteria. Uh, Tom Burke has been working with both um, those principals. South is doing breakfast in the classroom. Um, we've had some conversations with um, East in terms of looking at doing breakfast in the classroom there as well. So those principals are all recognizing and, and reaching out and as we as Karen noted it was taken out of this grant but we were lucky enough to have the EOS Foundation, EOS Foundation. and we also have the Department of Education nutrition component has offered us two grants which we've written for one we got and one we're still waiting for to expand so the opportunities, the breakfast initiative is a state initiative, yeah. and and we're jumping on at a great time. But it's 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 not something that, you know, we're working on each each year with each of the principals. Great. And I'm sorry, just two more quick questions. Um, the catch curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it's a curriculum we've offered in sixth grade, and now we're expanding it to seventh. Six, and seven, and eight. Yeah. So is that a is that a progressive curriculum? So, so if the kid kids who got it in sixth, they're not just getting the same curriculum no. in seventh grade. It's a, no. it's a, it's a progressive right. curriculum. We've just exactly. never been allowed to to institute the seventh and eighth grade components because well, of we, we time didn't, or other issues. We didn't really look at we we've, we've always partnered with UMass and they offered the, it in the sixth grade and then we we didn't really look at them coming in in seven and eight. Um, now what we're lean, looking towards them doing is doing the professional development for the the health education staff on what seventh and eighth. So so my teachers will get that curriculum and then we'll integrate those lessons into the existing nutrition curriculum. So. And then um, I didn't see our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders from our K-8 schools on there, the Davis and the Raymond. They will receive all of the health education and all the parent academy piece. Um, the piece that, that we weren't able to incorporate would be the CrossFit piece um, and the additional staff. And was there a particular reason for that? Or because we were limited or they didn't fall under qualifications? or? Not that I'm trying to slight them in any way. I mean, the, the point was is that the majority of the school is elementary level, and okay. you know, a, a big gist of it is there. I believe the populations, we just had a site on certain buildings at that time to be able to do this tonight, where we thought we could make the bigger impact with a larger amount of students in the building, like the bigger buildings, and uh, that's where we found <laughs> no problem. Right. Just wondering. I just noticed yeah. they were absent, so. Yes. Thank you. Well, just from one piece. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Just from one piece. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be able to do it. Uh, maybe down the road. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. My question was about RK eights. The yeah. sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at RK eights. They weren't listed as getting extra additional teachers. I'm done. Thank you. I guess my questions are really on the um, the data collection and, and and how that's done. So you mentioned the, the youth risk survey. Uh, can you explain what that is? We. We have been doing a youth risk behavior survey that mimics the state survey um, that's given to the middle school and high school for a, a number of years. It, it was a requirement back when we had Safe and Drug Free Schools grant. And so it's we try to do it every two years. There's usually funding issues involved with it. Um, and there's been times when we've partnered. So we have, um, we have been through the COPS grant 
been able to recently do it in 2012 and 2014. It's a series of questions on um, healthy risk behaviors. Um, do you wear a seatbelt? Um, do you eat fruits and vegetables? How much fitness do you get? Um, do you ever ride in a car when somebody's texting? Questions of that nature. And so we, we do that every two years. Um, for this grant, we won't have to do that survey. And there's been some district conversation about the different tools that are available and whether we want to stay with the user risk behavior survey. But for our data collection here, and as Karen mentioned, we did the webinar, we'll be using the pre and post questions from uh, UMass Extension. Okay. Is it possible to get a copy of that survey? Of the survey itself? Yeah, that, sure. that was given to students. I, I'd just oh. be curious to see what the questions were and, mm -hmm. and that. Um, the other question I had is, so uh, once all this program is, is done and, and stats are formulated and data is collected, you're submitting this data to the federal government. Yeah. What data are you submitting specifically to the federal government, I suppose? The, the data in includes um, data that we will collect through the, the FitnessGram software that the physical education teachers will, they will input data from that, from the pedometer readings and that three-day physical activity recall instrument they'll input that data, so we'll actually feed that data back to the Office of Safe and Healthy Students. And, and then as well as um, the, the results of the survey, we just the mm -hmm. YRBS questions on the fruit and vegetable consumption. And those, those are basically the two, what they call GIPRA measures that they're looking for our data from. And we're sort of in a learning curve right now. We, we Every month or every couple of weeks, actually, we've been um, webinars. on webinars. So they're, they're sort of tutoring us through all of this. We just found out it was three times the first year and two times the next year and so forth. So each, each every two weeks we have some type of a, a feedback or a seminar from the from the government and they'll tell us exactly how, for instance, they left us with deciding on how many students you actually have to submit as your data. It, it doesn't have to be every single child in the building. Um, so we're, we're sort of learning what their expectations of us are in this during the summer so that, but we do know that as early as I think November or December we have to have some data for them. So to be honest with you, we're still learning what they expect of us. Is, is BMI used in any of these calculations? No. Not anymore. No. Uh, basically, what the government wants from my aspect of it is they want to see if the time and effort and money that they have spent has made any significant difference in the fitness level of the students. And we have a lot of measures and we have, what will happen is we'll give them a pretest when they come in using that instrument. And then the beauty of physiological activities is that over a length of time, you will be able to see a significant increase because of their test score results. Well, that's what the government wants to see over the course of three years. Uh, is this working? What can we do to change it? Uh, did we meet our measures of what our goals were? That's the type of data collection through those instruments that we have to give them. Great. What Th they want. Thank you. And just one quick question. So, uh, the, you mentioned body image issues, and 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 that that um, you know having a, a teenager who certainly went through that as, as a as a young teenage girl, I, I certainly understand that. How is that incorporated into the curriculum? What exactly, you know, how does that? work, I guess. As far, uh, you as know, far what, as what is, what is going to be the curriculum around that? As far as what? As, as far as, is there going to be, you know, somebody coming in to talk about body image? Is there going to no. be... No. See, uh, that isn't addressed with us in the physical education aspect of it Not at all. Uh, that might be dealt with when they talk about health and wellness in the classroom when they cover that unit. Body mass and all that type of thing is used in the scope of an overall improvement of being one of the components that measures that particular fitness level. What they do is that there'll be an aerobic part to the test to see, you know, the lungs capacity, how you've done there. Physical strength test. It's a standardized test that they've developed that they use across the whole country. And those scores are what will be reported. As far as height and weight and body mass index, 
that isn't used anymore on that particular test. That, that was phased out to be able to do that. So I know where you're going as far as, you know, worrying about what it's going to say and, and things of that nature. That doesn't come into the picture at all. Yeah. We are thinking that having having the fitness that kids really do like to focus on and having the new curriculum of CrossFit that, you know, maybe they're not so great at volleyball as, or basketball, as Peter said, that is a, that's the skills and the games component of phys ed is really important. And so I think there's going to be an opportunity for boys and girls to try something different, something new with new equipment and so that, and have success. And it's individual goals for themselves, they'll be able to raise those and I think that's we'll, Peter's folks will be able to tell them look at you doing that much better on that skill already that I think is going to weigh into their adolescent uh, you know uh, image of themselves mm -hmm. it, it's going to make them feel better the idea that they can go to a cooking class after school they can go to an intramurals if they're really into something there's now this opportunity that we weren't able to afford them and I think that's that's the exciting part yeah. thank yeah. you yeah. very much yeah, one of the good things about cross stimulating activity yeah. 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 It is to actual pick apart where your negativities are. Right. right. Yeah. I think one of the good things about CrossFit is that you can be um, a very, very athletic student that's involved with a lot of sports and games, or maybe not quite so athletic, and and right. still be able to see improvement and see progress. That's the one of the beauties. Of Great. The Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Last part of the um, discussion, I think self-esteem, is, is that what you were leaning towards, Ray, yeah. with this more than, and I may be wrong, the actual physical size was the self-esteem in the typical age group on the teasing, I won't say bullying per se, but there's that general teasing that goes on. But that really wasn't my questions that I have, just a comment on what's going on. On the biking part of the program, part of it was where or how would the, some of the youngsters that we have in the city who do not have access, you said there would be 20 bikes available possibly? Per school. Per school. Per, per school. Per school. Oh, okay. Yeah, per school. Then another, is this a seasonal program per se, or is it going oh. to be run? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. We were thinking yeah. we would do the, the um, cooking and eating from, or, you know, healthy eating from October to March, and then from March until June would be the biking program. Okay. And we have to do some, again, in, some investment Investigating, we know that through Jane's work with the Walk on Wednesday and Mass Safe Routes to School, she reached out to them to find out that there was a bike program. So we have to re reconnect with those folks and say, guess what? We got the grant. Um, now can you come down and tutor us on what needs to happen? How do we how do we be you know fair with the bikes? How do we find how do we train the advisors? Because we want kids to be able to service the bikes. We we have a lot of questions ourselves, but we know that that free training and that. Free Free technical assistance is there through Mass Safe Route, so we we need to again reach out to them. To happen. Um. Some of the things I was thinking of uh, the bikes themselves, even for some of the kids arrive from home, although that's some of their family's business, but safety factors with yep. them, depending on what time of year it is. Yep. Uh, lots of our neighborhoods, and some of the better neighborhoods, don't have the lighting they should have, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So reflectors, uh, lights, as when I grew up that they had on bikes, they don't have too much anymore, <laughs> but at least some kind of reflector, reflectors or armbands mm -hmm. or jet or kind of a, uh, similar to what the crossing guys, maybe not that right. extent, but something that will reflect light uh, on these children as they're riding. And another piece was, you were talking about possibly uh, before school and after school, so many of the kids that need these programs are the ones that don't have the transportation. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of how do we get these kids to the school early enough to participate and then back home again when transportation is a major problem for us just to get them to school on a regular day's basis. Um, yeah. It's nice to say parents can bring them to and from the school, but it's usually those kids that need it the most whose parents can't afford to do that. Either they do not have the vehicles to do it or they're working two or three jobs and they're gone before the kids go to school and they don't come back until after the kids are after school. They're not in the city in a lot of cases. So I don't know if you would given any thoughts to, to these pieces. And one more piece, there are one or two persons that 
have been going around the city collecting bikes and then they were giving them, I believe, to the police department at one time, and I forget where the other place was, they were repairing them and just providing them for mm -hmm. uh, children to use them. And if that's still going on, I don't know, but I know a couple of times the newspaper had, you know, made, uh, had a story about that. So you may want to look into that, to which would be another that. source for <laughs> bicycles for those children whose families couldn't afford the, the, the bikes mm -hmm. themselves. That sounds like a great yeah. resource. And the helmets yeah. and other safety equipment that goes yeah. with it. So. I know the mass safe, the mass reach to school people, their safety is a big part of their curriculum. Right. So uh, we believe that we believe to tap into their expertise as far as the safety curriculum. They'll, they'll, like Mary Ellen just said that they're going to provide a train the trainer piece, uh, right. train the trainer program for our teachers so that they can, teachers and, and folks that are interested in being after school advisors right. for the bike safety program. So that'll be a, a real important piece. There was one more piece. Years ago, before there was federal money, programs were really devised by the, the neighborhood <laughs> businesses to provide dollars for things like this. So no matter what the particular place was, they provided, as they do like with Little League and some of the others, the uniforms, etc. So we're talking, in this case, equipment possibly, uh, a similar kind of uh, program to, in essence, checking with maybe some of those and that's something maybe we can look into for a lot of things for some of our youngsters so they can participate in certain programs because they, they, the families themselves, unfortunately, do not have the resources, you know, so they could uh, participate. Well, the good thing with this grant is we have three years <laughs> and we've had it for two months. <laughs> And it's a learning curve each right. each time we go to a webinar we take our copious notes and go back to the drawing board and, and peel the layers right. off. But it's all good. And and so it's exciting and and um, we think it's a great opportunity for our for our students. Sounds very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Mrs. Joyce has a question or a comment. Okay. <laughs> um, in the beginning of the presentation you noted the Preference priority one is the persistently lowest achieving schools being North Middle School, West Middle School, and B.B. Russell. What, what about those schools sets them aside, sets them apart from the other middle schools? That was that was actually a part of the the, the Office of Safe and Drugs Office of Safe and Healthy Students. I'm sorry, uh, part of their guidelines, and it's actually they, they were published on that list federally. So, um, okay. on I don't our exactly. on our programs, pretty consistent throughout all of the schools. So why would they be identified? I think that they're they're. I don't know why. Right. Um, it was so, it was a while ago. Yeah, I don't know why okay. they were listed. Yeah, yeah. That's to tell you the truth. <laughs> Other middle schools on there, or those were just the ones you those chose? Those are the only ones no, from our right. district on there. That were right. on there. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Our program is pretty consistent throughout all of the middle schools. Is that correct? Well, do they, in terms of they, physical education right. and health education, that wasn't. I don't think that was what they were looking at. They were looking at oh, the overall. the yeah. overall. Mm -hmm. um, academic achievement, I believe. Right. I believe it was not yeah. that right. health wasn't here or PE was here. You're right, those those are, are pretty consistent. So but that was probably one of the qualifiers probably looking at the state of Massachusetts right. Right. on exactly. middle Based schools. On high right. I don't, I'll have to see what it is. I'm not right. sure, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. But that, to be honest, they mean academic. I'm surprised to see West if that's one of the indicators. I know they have a high yeah. level of, mm -hmm. of um, participation in their after-school programs, their intramural programs, their sports programs, so I'm kind of surprised to see that, and I would question why these particular middle schools were singled out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, another question I have is, um, what are the middle schools currently scheduled for PE on a daily basis or weekly basis, Peter? Um. As of right now, most of the traditional middle schools, except for the ones that run on uh, trimesters, um, and that's just Pluff, I understand, Pluff right? And Ashfield. And Ashfield, okay. And Ashfield. They run on a different schedule. Um, most of the traditional middle schools are on a four-day cycle. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's on a 
four day schedule and each class usually meets once every four days. So, so some weeks it could be one time and depending how the schedule falls, it could be as many as two times in a week. And what's the block of time that they meet? Uh, for the traditional middle schools, it's about 55 minutes. So they're required to get 60 minutes of activity a day. That's and right now they're getting 55 minutes of activity every four days? Uh, or approximately a week, but that's So how are you gonna bridge that gap? To, excuse me? How are you gonna bridge that gap? Um, we can't really bridge the gap because the schedule is what it is. I right, mean, but you're required to by the conditions well, of the grant. That, well, by the grant, we're just going to bombard them as much as we can to be able to give them as much activity. Okay, between, but when and where? Between school, their own activity, between before school, and what they do on weekends by themselves. And That's school, the only so way we can meet the criteria. So it's not structured? Uh, some is and some isn't. And if the it's, only one and if it's based home. on what they do at home, right. how can you qualify that and how can you... Because they believe that the grant allows for the use of pedometers that will be strapped to them. They will be allowed to take them home with them and they measure the amount on the pedometer that they can transcribe into okay. activity. And every single one of our middle school students is going to go home with one of these? Uh, we will be able to get approximately a population of probably a third of what we deal with because we're allowed to take a random sample. That's part of the grant. So but not every student school. will have it. Well, we're gonna try to be able to do that. But basically what we need to meet the criteria is because if we have schools that are over 500 kids in a school, yep. we're allowed to random sample just for feasibility of collecting data. Sure, okay. Can our intramural programs be part of this? Yes, that's what the morning that? program is Okay, can be. any of the funding be utilized for our intramural programs? Uh, it comes with the criteria as part of the job description and these people will be able to do that and I still do have money left in the intramural program so we can be able to do that yes there's been, there isn't a problem with supplying staff to do that right but uh, my question is using the funding from the grant to pay for the for the staff for intramural so pay yes. for part of the program yeah. instead it has of to be the CrossFit program funding. No. It, we're going to be offering CrossFit program though. Right, but the point is, I know what she's getting at. Okay. I still have a lot of money to hire people. Yeah, but we don't have any money. Okay, so I'm looking at shifting some of the money that you have in your program so you can use your grant funding and we can use some of your money for other purposes such as parent liaisons. That I don't know about. Okay. That, that so, we have to talk to Mr. Haldo. Okay. <laughs> really? okay, well. I don't know. Okay, so how about can we utilize any of the funding from this grant for the parent liaisons? We, we, we've already started to talk. We've yes. got some, yeah, so yeah. some discussions One of the things about we, moving to when this all happened, mm -hmm. and we didn't want to jeopardize the grant, so when you're given a grant on certain criteria, we have already had this discussion. We've identified about, I'm going to say about $36,000. We're trying to see if we can use that for parent liaisons. Um, but we haven't. The school committee hasn't. We have to get permission That's from the government. That's what I'm government. trying to do right now. <laughs> yeah, we have to get, we have to get, permission, to get permission to change a budget that, that you submit before we can do, that. Before we can do it. Okay, okay. so right now, it. you can't supplant it to use for intramural sports right now. Right. And right now, you can't utilize the funds to bring back parent liaisons for the purpose of the program. We we submitted, we, we asked to be able to do that because we, we've been talking about that but we have not heard anything from the government in order to change a line item okay. see we, we always so have to ask first right. when we originally wrote it it was that the parent liaisons would here. be in place yeah. and they were written in as, as a plus for us meaning we already have them we'll right. have them getting the word out supporting the grant right. so when all of this happened and the parent liaisons were gone first of all we were concerned because it was written as part of the grant so we have now we're going to be asking the federal government can we take some of, shift some money in the grant and actually pay for a number of parent liaisons and possibly bring them back. Yeah, because they seem to be a real critical piece of the yeah, absolutely. very yes. universal access absolutely. piece. Absolutely, yes. That piece is, is yeah. And, that's, and we're hoping that the people who give the permission for shifting of funds or moving line items will see that it was an integral part to the grant. Okay. But we can't make that's, those that's decisions. Yeah. Any idea on when you expect to hear back on that? 
Uh, we hope in the next few weeks. It's, okay. it's, it, it usually is not a fast answer. So if you could <laughs> share that with us right. once you know, oh, yeah. that would be great. Right. Because and, and, and that will help in our decision correct, making. Though. As we look at grants, we're going to be looking right. to, again, if it's some of our Chapter 70 money, we're going to be looking for a grant to cover that and shift it back in mm -hmm. another way. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what we've certainly been talking about with all grants. Okay, so that is so, something we discussed. So we can utilize before school programs or count before school programs, we can count intramurals as well as what the kids do on their own mm -hmm. right. towards this fitness the goal. goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And don't and forget, the they're going to be exposed to different fitness activities, hoping that they will like it and then do more on their own. So, for instance, if for some reason somebody all of a sudden decides they want to ride a bike and then they get into biking on the weekends by themselves or they liked the aerobic piece, they will seek out the why or they'll seek out other opportunities. And that's another piece that Peter's staff will be doing is, is set, getting that message across that it's not just what you're doing here in school, it's what you're doing at home, so don't go home and do this all night. Go take a walk and okay. take your pedometer with you. I, that I kind really of liked the early steps. exposure to different skills and different games yes. because <clears throat> To wait until they get to the high school to try out volleyball, right. it's almost too late. Right. Let them try it out when they're younger. Right. Let them try different things that they may not have had the opportunity to try. Right. And I really like that, to expose them to those, those games and skills. Um, so the other, the other question I had is an equity issue with the other two middle school programs we have because we have a we have a significant population in our K to eight and I, I I respectfully disagree with you, Mr. Caruso, on getting the bang for your buck because we have those are major um, middle school populations and I think we have a big equity issue if we don't provide the, that opportunity to those two populations, especially if we're providing it to the B.B. Russell alternative where you have a, even a, a lower population. So I would implore upon you to consider expanding that program to the, the entire middle school populations in all of the schools. And I guess that's it for now. So we'll be looking forward to hearing back from you on the funding mechanisms and how we can utilize the funds and also expanding the programs to all of our middle school populations. Right. And in talking, I will mention also in talking about equity, one of the things that we actually did today, and it was the first time since I've been here with our executive team, is we brought the director down from the grants department, Laurie Silva, to go over with us every single grant that we're going for. And the conversation that started after that was to set up a committee. Um, we'll start with Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry, our executive director is June Saber and uh, Cliff Murray. And we're going to take a look at the grants to make sure we're reading the mandates of grants and trying to see and sometimes you make decisions I know we've done this with 21st century grants some of the after school you'll have a better chance with certain schools than others so again sometimes you have to be particular about what you're doing but we're going to put this group to start to take a look at the grant with our grant writers and our teams our collaborators and give them some direction from the executive team by the same token we can then shift if something has to go to Dr. Tarasi if there's a grant that's more in his expertise uh, you know or deputy superintendent Thomas or wherever the uh, direction is coming from. So that is something we'll be working you know, with our grants department in uh, a much more, hopefully we're growing it when I say much more collaborative way mm -hmm. and to give them support and direction. So I, I, I want to thank you. I know how hard you worked on this as you said uh, a number of years ago and, and I think I would be remiss at this point. I do want to share with the uh, school committee just this week we were told uh, of the death of one of our phys ed teachers at the high school, uh, Linda Etta. Linda had been with us for many, many years in the Brockton Public Schools, a valued member. Uh, Mike Thomas and I worked with Linda together back at East Junior High. I think it was her first year and Mr. Thomas's first year. So, you know, we're, we're, we're offer sympathy to the family um, and sympathy to our phys ed department and certainly to our high school. So we're, we're here to, uh, to support the family of Linda Etta and uh, I'd like to ask just for a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm excellent.
Six, 12 are extremely competitive. Are there any incentives in the program to use that competitiveness to have them participate? You mean in team sports? Well, in however to come up with reaching your goal. As of right now, um, there is a distinct distinction between competitive activities and athletics in the fitness area. Um, what this is geared towards, sir, is basically a lifestyle change. That's what the ultimate goal is of the fitness, the CrossFits, the biking, the swimmings, any kind of physical shaping activity, why people go to Zumba, why do they go to CrossFit. It's more personal than it is collective. We do a pretty good job, or we always have done a good job in the competitive area. There's more than enough competitive levels that they can compete at between the community, what we have in our particular system. But the focus of the grant was more toward the personal than the competitive edge, sir, the way that it was designed. But I could still see using now, that yeah. as opposed yeah. to, you're talking more of the organized, formal, what I call right. formal sports or games or whatever. Correct. Any kid, you watch them play, a group of kids, they're competitive Correct. in everything they do. So I'm just saying, tapping into that, whether it be, we're going to ride the bike to school every day, or we're going to walk two blocks instead of one or what have you when you send kids home on the academic side you know reading books for the summer I want to read all the books I can as opposed to one because I get the gold star whatever it may be at the end I'm talking that kind of maybe incentive something that's not off the charts as far as our ability to do something but just introducing somehow that competitiveness for them to change their own lifestyle um, that's the kind of thing I think by tapping into that you overachieve your goal. Certainly we can we can do that type of thing through the instructional piece where if they would like to go and pursue CrossFit competitions on their own or, or things of that nature. But the only thing that we have that resembles that that we've had for over 50 years is our annual fitness days that we have where they can compete for the schools that we've been doing them for yeah. over 50 years. You're still thinking that's straight in the yeah, box. I, I want out the box out stuff. The box. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm talking about. Out the box. Because again, if it's, it's you're saying they're working. They have the predominant. They're, they're right. doing something. So they're being measured for that. Uh, if they think, when I come in, I'm, I'm in the third grade, did I outwalk all the other kids in my classroom? Yeah, okay, just that kind of a piece. Nice. That's the kind of stuff that gets them going. What they achieve, they haven't quite got to high level where it's gotta be a goal with some kind of hard type of uh, reward or award, whichever for it. So just tapping into that energy that they have and just being creative about it. Correct. Those deviations can be done by the teachers in their individual Right, buildings. and that's, that's on the front end. Wow. And also being yeah. careful, very careful, that the predominance are very positively used Correct. so that they don't think it's something else that's on the negative side Correct. okay without bringing that up per se too because um, I'm sure that will come up from some of these youngsters so. okay I, I just have four more questions <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one, two. This is my fitness for today. I got up four times and sat back down. Thanks. I think we're good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, next item, presentation of associate principals. It is, uh, and uh, I know um, there has been so much talk um, about associate principals. There has been talk about our reading resource specialist, our instructional resource specialist. I actually spent uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, at a meeting I had with Maya Carpenter uh, talking about the differences and the importance of our instructional, uh, our excuse me, our associate principals, and talking again and reminding people about our reading resource specialists and our instructional resource specialists, our teachers that are supporting instruction in the classroom. They are not administrators. So again, uh, that being said, I thought it would be important where we have four new school committee members to share some information about these very important positions in the district. And I did want to ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Liz Barry to give us a little bit of an introduction on our associate principals and uh, they are going to do a presentation for us this evening. Good evening.
evening, Superintendent Smith and members of the school committee. Um, I am here tonight not to present, um, but rather to introduce a hardworking, committed team, um, one in which serves a critical role here in the Brockton Public Schools, the associate principals. Um, and as most of you know, we have associate principals at Brockton High School. Uh, Robert Perkins could not be here this evening. We also have associate principals at our two K-8 schools, John Lynch, who is here tonight. He's the associate principal at the Davis School. Inez Enos, who is the associate at the Raymond. Um, she is unable to be here tonight. And we have associates at four of our um, middle schools. Celeste Hogue, who is here. She is the associate at East Middle School. Christina olanson Really, the associate at South Middle School. Allison Ramsey, the associate at North Middle School. And Juliana Kennard, who's the associate at West Middle School. And I will tell you that although they cannot all be here, um, they collaborated all of them together and put together this presentation. Um, I'm not going to talk too much except really just to say, um, you know, in, in a large district with large schools, um, improved student achievement is um, absolutely, it takes many players, and the players are at the district level as well as the school level. Um, and while the district curriculum coordinators have an important job of chartering the overall district course for curriculum, instruction, and assessment for all of our schools, it truly is the associate principals in each one of our schools who translates that information and really initiates things at the school level with, of course, the support of their building principals. Um, over the years, um, many of you have been on the school committee and you have actually seen um, improved student achievement take place at the middle school level and as well as um, at the high school level. And um, we really do feel that the associate principal is, is one strong contributor to that overall success. And I will say too that over the years they've, they've displayed um, improved achievement but at the same time, we've had several mandates at the state and district level, many mandates which which really have impacted schools. Um, you know, as accountability has changed and as our demands have changed at the district and school level, the role of the associate principal really has evolved to support um, whatever comes down the pike in terms of mandates, initiatives, and accountability. Um, and they really, um, their role has really evolved to include a myriad of responsibilities. So they're here tonight really just to speak to you more in depth about what these responsibilities are. And um, they are going to present in the same fashion in which they collaborated to um, construct this presentation. So they'll actually be, um, all of them will play a role in sharing some information with you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Celeste Hogue. I'm the associate principal at East Middle School. Um, I have the first slide, which is entitled Curriculum and Instruction. I'd like to jump out of order here a little bit and um, note the fourth bullet. Um, review unit lesson plans, unit and lesson plans for the items that are noted there. Um, in this role, we review these on a weekly basis. This is done um, for the reasons that are listed there, but ultimately, this enables our students to get the most out of every class and attain the greatest achievement. For example, as part of our school improvement plan, um, or SIP, we at East, like many of the other schools, had very focused writing goals. When reviewing lesson plans, I made connections over the years for teachers who may be on different teams or in different grades, but may benefit from observing one another's best practice. For example, a science teacher may not be an expert at teaching writing in their class, but yet with the new Common Core standards, that's a requirement for her or him to do. So when you're reviewing lesson plans, you can make those connections for teachers who are on various teams. You can go in with that teacher and, re and observe classes, and then you can have teachers coach teachers in addition to yourself, because just as adults, just as students and just as adults, adults learn differently. Some people like to be have modeling done for them, but some people ultimately need to see it in practice. And in the end, that science teacher will bring back those best practices to his or her students, and our students will benefit from those 
from those practices. Jumping back to the first three bullets listed there, these seem very straightforward. However, I'd like to give a very specific example of how these come to life through a student. When I was at the Huntington as a reading resource specialist, I got to know a fourth grader who had come from Cape Verde. As you know, my job at the Huntington went away and I went back to East. Um, the student went on to the Davis as a fifth grade SEI student and then to North as a sixth grade SEI student. She was mainstreamed at North into a general education class and in November of her seventh grade year, her family moved within the city like so many of our students do. She landed at East in a general education seventh grade class and I was thrilled. However, as an associate principal, like Deputy Superintendent Barry mentioned, we, in, we implement district and unit frames. This child did not miss a beat when she arrived at East. Um, her ELA and math classes at North were at similar places in the pacing charts, so instructionally, as a limited English proficient student, she continued to succeed. Because she was still considered an LEP, I had to design, like my other colleagues do as well, specific schedule for her so that she could be in comp so that we could as a district be in compliance with state and national requirements she still received minimal ESL support ESL support and she had to be made sure that she was placed with teachers who had the correct training to teach LEP students now she just finished the 8th grade and from the preliminary MCAS data she scored proficient no longer will need ESL support at the high school and will be going and I know she will be a star of Brockton we're going to save questions to the end, but if you have anything burning that you'd like to jump in, please do so. Okay, so this next slide has to do with supervision, supervision and evaluation. This is a major part of our job. Um, as you can tell, um, I'm going to actually jump down to the second to last bullet because it is um, probably our absolute favorite one, uh, which is conducting daily classroom walkthroughs. Uh, we try and do this as often as possible because this is when we get to see best practices in place. Um, for me, this is my time, um, one of my times to connect with students. Um, I get to walk into a classroom, sit next to a student, um, ask them questions, and sometimes they say, Mrs. O, stop asking me questions. Um, but this is, this is my time to connect with the students and the teachers. Um, if you go back up to the top, um, we do a lot of collaboration with the principal in hiring, training, and supporting new staff. And uh, this past year at South, we had um, quite a few new teachers, and I spent a lot of time with them over the course of, of the year. New teachers need a lot of support, and they need a lot of guidance, and and some hand-holding, and that is part of our job, and it's part of the job that we love. We also conduct teacher evaluations, and as you all know, we had a new educator evaluation system that was put into place this year. At the beginning of the year, we were responsible for training the staff uh, on this new evaluation system, but it didn't just end with a one-day training. Uh, this was a, a year-long implementation, and we were uh, the, the major supporters of that in training uh, and supporting our staff throughout the year. Um, we also support building-based uh, implementation of district-wide initiatives. So when you heard um, uh, Mary Ellen and Peter talking about that uh, district initiative and the grant, uh, we will be a part of that and we will be talking to them and helping our health teachers and our phys ed teachers implementing that grant. So when you asked about um, some of the uh, things that might be put into place in a classroom for those students, um, that's what we would help those physical education teachers do. I would sit down with our PE teacher and say, you know, what are some competitive aspect, aspects we can put into your lesson plans to help support this grant? That's, that's part of our job as well. Next slide. The next slide has to do with professional development. We are responsible in our buildings for planning, conducting, creating uh, all of the professional development that takes place at the building level. Uh, that includes department meetings and looking at data and data analysis through TestWiz and STAR and Infinite Campus. And um, sometimes that includes targeted, differentiated instruction for our staff based on what we see and what the needs are. I do want to make an important note that you can see at the bottom 
bottom there, that PD at the middle schools takes place during the school day throughout the year without any additional funding for substitutes because we put it into our schedule. So it is unlike what happens at the K-8 to schools, the elementary schools, and the high school. Uh, I'd like you to reference uh, two sheets at the end of your packet. The first page has to do with professional development. This is actually something from my school. And it's a, a long list of bullet points of professional development that I have done at South since 2010. Now, I've done PD at South for the past six, seven years. It's been a long time. Um, I've been there for 10 years as the associate. And I've done PD. Actually, I take that back. It's close to eight years that I've done professional development at South. And so I'm taking you back here four years, um, some of the trainings that I've done with my staff, they include brain-based teaching, uh, understanding um, mindset. Uh, we, we read a lot of books. I read it, do a lot of staff readings um, uh, with my staff, a lot of case studies. Uh, I do, I set up peer observations in my school. Um, and again, I also like to note this is from South, but this is not just what I do. This takes place at all of the middle schools uh, in professional development. I just wanted to give you a snapshot of what happens at South. I also, if you turn to the next page, uh, this is a, I guess you could say it's hard to do a, a day in the life of, but I, I did a, a month in the life of an associate principal. Uh, this is a calendar that I give out to my staff uh, every month, and I know the other associates do this as well. We also send this to central office. This is a calendar of events that takes place during a, uh, during a month at the school, and it includes pretty much every everything that we do. And I apologize it's not on the PowerPoint for those of you who are wondering where it is. It is in the packet that they have. What you'll notice is that we have PD set up every day. Uh, some days are with guidance and some days are with me. At my particular school, if you look at a day A, I teach those courses to my teachers on a day A. On a day B, I might sit down and plan lessons with them. If you look at that second full week in January, we are in charge of all testing in a building and all compliance with testing. So you see access testing during that week and the following week, that is what we are in charge of. When we are gonna talk about testing a little more in detail, when we, when we say we are in charge of testing, we are literally in charge of the booklets having to do with testing. Uh, we don't let anybody touch those, they are sacred to us. Uh, they know what I'm talking about. Um, if you also look down, we have MCAS simulations on half days. We are in charge of putting those together for our students. And we're in charge of things like working with the guidance on grading windows and, and um, events that happen like that. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next slide, which is assessment. And then Julie's going to talk about assessment. I'm Julie Kennard and I'm from West Middle School. The, um, we're in charge of all of the state and district assessments that are done. The teachers do their own classroom assessments, but we're in charge of all the state and district ones. Um, and this isn't assessment just to grade or place kids, but it's also to inform instruction, find out where we are, where the kids are. Are we meeting all the needs of the students and what do we have to do better? Um, one of the biggest ones is MCAS that starts in January when we have to order them and then we start getting them in March. We have to, uh, we are responsible for the books from the moment they come in till they go out and we have 610 kids in our school but we test in about 70 different groups so it's every single bin with exactly what every student needs so it's, it's a lot of work before the testing and then we do all the testing and then we the retesting, we're the ones that take the kids who are absent and um, do all the extra makeup tests testing. And the results will start coming in and the, we'll be looking at it probably the second week of September. The uh, teachers will look at, there'll be a lot of celebrating because kids did well. There'll be a lot of celebrating when they notice the kids that are proficient that they either knew they would be or they're really excited that they did get there. But then they'll also start looking at what can I do better? My kids missed question six. I can't believe they missed it. I've got to teach it better. There's a lot of then teacher reflection as to what we need to do better this year based on um, how our kids did. Uh, the other one that, that Weeder Access starts in January and that is for all of, that's a test for all of the bilingual students. Uh, my building only has 58 but um, I say only because Allison and Celeste work with about 200 and um, 
that every single uh, student has to take four different sessions. They are tested in listening, reading, writing, and speaking. The speaking part of the test is one-to-one, -one, so at least half of the kids in each of our buildings, we actually do the one-to-one -one testing, which takes about a half hour. It's um, it's nice though because you get to first sit down, you want to make them comfortable, so you sit and you have just a social conversation with them and you can find out a little bit more about them and then you say, okay, now we have to do the test. But it gives us that opportunity to sit with students and the, do the test. Moving forward towards park this year, I'm sure that it's going to be the same security and the same kind of setting up exactly what the bins need. Um, and also probably, um, teaching the students more of the, uh, the the differences in park. It's going to be a different kind of test. And making sure that the um, lessons that are building up to them, looking at the unit plans and the uh, lessons that the teachers are doing in classes to make sure that we are ready for park. STAR is a district assessment that we've been um, using. And three times a year, all students take a math test and um, a reading test. And this identifies for us where their strengths and weaknesses are. We can pull up a report from STAR that tells us exactly where the students are and what are the next four or five skills that we should work on so then our interventionists can be very specific about what skills they're working one-to-one -one with a student so it's a it's a really good way to um, really target what that student needs or even like what a whole classroom needs and embedded in the star program there are lessons that will uh, that we can pull right up to give to the students right off the, the district um, district-wide common assessments are done um, in math, English, and language arts um, this year, and we're moving into social studies and science next year. And to get that's that's something that we are responsible for going through. We're running the test through TestWiz, going to the um, department meetings and analyzing the data. What is it telling us about our instruction, and what is it telling us about our students, and what else do we need to work on to improve? The last three tests are tests that we proctor, the National Latin Exam and the Algebra Placement in the New England Math League, because the Latin teacher can't be in the room while they're taking the test, so we have to do the proctoring. Um, but basically, we all of that state and district assessment, that's us. Good evening, I'm Allison Ramsey, I'm the Associate Principal at North. I'm here to talk to you about our role with scheduling. So first what we do is we work with the principal and the guidance department to create the master schedule for the school. Now this might sound like an easy task, but it is a big jigsaw puzzle. What we do is we look at the different teachers, their certifications, and we figure out where they're going to be best placed. We have to use our resources wisely, so we have to manipulate that. Also, um, as you know, our schools have very limited space, so sometimes and at North, mostly every period, every room is full. So a lot of the teachers travel, so we have to make sure with the different grades and the different lunches, their periods are at different times. So literally, it's a jigsaw puzzle to try to make sure nothing overlaps. Um, with the student schedules, once we have the master schedule in place, pretty much each student has a schedule designed for them. If they need a math intervention, we make sure that that's where they're placed. If they need an ELA intervention, it's there in that as well. We are lucky and f we have the flexibility in our schedule so that the classes are, if a student is has moved out of an intervention because they are excelling, we have a class to slide them in. Also, if we have a student that's not doing as well, we can slide them into an intervention. So we have to be very flexible with our schedule. Um, currently, what I'm doing is I'm working with the um, department heads of the um, special ed department to make sure that all of our sped kids have the right classes to make sure they're in compliance. Um, at North this year, we have two new strands. We have um, a seventh grade and an eighth grade inclusion class that we didn't have before. So we're trying to figure all that out to make sure all the kids have the accommodations they need. 
Same with the bilingual. As Julie mentioned, we do the access test for the bilingual students. That tells us what their proficiency level is in the English language. Based on their proficiency level, they have to have certain hours of ESL instruction. So we have to make sure that their schedule, and depending on each student's proficiency level, it can all be different. Um, we have to make sure that we meet that standard as well. And as Julie mentioned about assessment, we create the master schedules for all the testing. With STAR, as she mentioned, that's three times a year. Um, with the MCAS, we have to make sure our small groups are in compliance as well. Good evening. My name is John Lynch. I'm the associate principal at the Davis School, K to eight. Um, I'm speaking. I'm doing this particular slide for Inez, who is not with us tonight because she's very busy. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, uh, par parent and community involvement is is strong. It starts at the beginning of the year with open houses. It goes through the year with National History Days. We also have cultural days uh, where students bring in foods and so forth that. Uh, it, it's just a, it's, it's just something that we can get parents included. Uh, um, um, we have a wax museum day uh, where parents come in uh, for day at the Davis. We call it. Parents are invited in to come to any classroom. Classrooms are working on projects that they've been working on all year, and or for instance, the sixth grade taking over the library as uh, individual Abraham Lincoln's and uh, Babe Ruth's and so forth. Uh, as, as part of the Wax uh, Museum Day. The National History Day and the Science Fair Day, they, they call for protocols that the city is um, involved in letting us know, which we pass on to the teachers, who they then make sure that the students are following all the protocols. Spelling Bee is one of my favorite things. Uh, we started early at, in the K to 8, we don't start in kindergarten, but in third grade. Uh, the teachers basically get a finalist for each class, and then I run the, uh, the finals so to speak, of the school from third grade to eighth grade. And then they compete again at the Little Red Schoolhouse later on. Um, orientations uh, with Mrs. Campbell, the principal, we meet with each grade level and we discuss handbook issues uh, as well as uh, basically our uh, expectations for their year. And that includes academic ac expectations as well as behavior expectations. That in order to get to this point in your life and to achieve what and, and do well, that's going to involve your your preparation and your behavior. City Lab is a, a, a program that's run through the science department and uh, Bridgewater State University. We have many community involvements with Bridgewater State University at the Davis School. We probably have per semester 11 to 12 student teachers who come in and uh, are distributed from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. Uh, they are uh, they are tremendous. Uh, they learn a lot from learn a lot from our teachers, and are usually hired until this year, I guess. But are usually hired um, when they leave the building. If it's not by us at the Davis School, they may be hired at one of the middle schools and or one of the elementary schools. Uh, we do have um, a day at the Davis. The Bridgewater State uh, University people came over. Uh, I am the, the liaison to the Bridgewater State University for student teachers. They call it the PDS uh, department. And I meet with them once a month along with uh, uh, Mr. Tom who comes in and he's the evaluator for our student teachers. Moving on. Student engagement. I can't say more about this because uh, again K to 8, I, when I start my walkthroughs uh, I'll start in fifth grade and I'll be sitting next to a kindergarten on the rug uh, by, by halfway through. And it's so enjoyable to, to see students in kindergarten move from kindergarten to first grade to second grade all the way up through the eighth grade and then uh, into the high school. We have great success at our school going from K to 8. Uh, we work with our teachers diligently 
to make sure that all students are provided with targeted in instruction. We use that um, IST to find um, we use IST to find and facilitate response to interventions where we can tell the teacher, we'd like you to try this and this, and that will be the goal in uh, four to six weeks, we'll meet again. If the child has met the goal, let's move on. If they've not met the goal, let's take another course. So that's something that we, we do constantly with teachers and students, to meet with students to provide targeted instruction. Um, that's huge. It involves uh, d um, differentiated learning, differentiated teaching, as well as planning, which was brought up before, um, that we, we all look and we all plan with our teachers because it's so much a part now of Ed Eval and about all the things that they work on in their classroom. Um, so that's basically that. I'll let you. Um, as you know, um, the budget is no longer about just buying paper and folders. Um, each school is given a set amount of money and the needs of the school um, has to be assessed and that's a big part of our job. We work with the principal with that. Decisions are made to help um, move our student population to reach the highest achievement. Um, we, meet, we also meet with consultants um, and look for research-based resources, reach out to other districts and survey our parents and students about programming that will best help our students. But it doesn't just stop there. Once the programs and materials are bought and ordered, um, teachers are trained, and we handle um, in our buildings the troubleshooting and the monitoring of the programs. Um, all of this is done as part of our roles and responsibilities um, because this allows the teachers to teach and to reach all of our students without worrying about access to materials, technology, and resources so that our students can benefit the most. So we now, uh, that's the conclusion of our presentation, but we now invite you to ask any questions for any of us. Anybody have any questions or comments? No. Everyone took the questions out earlier. <laughs> well, um, a very good presentation. You certainly gave us perspective in terms of the roles uh, of the associate principal. Some of us have a little more um, interaction. I, I will say from personal experience that I know you take your jobs very seriously, um, especially when it comes to taking charge of the tests and the results. Um, I think one day I was at West and I thought I saw, I, I thought I heard Mrs. Carnard actually growl at me when I went towards the boxes. Um, and yeah, so, uh, and, and I think Mr. Murray has had his fingers slapped like in the old days in parochial school, but. Um, I never double counted. Yeah, okay. But um, we certainly appreciate what you do. We know that uh, the numbers are certainly high in our um, middle school population and um, it really is an overwhelming job so um, I, I certainly see the value mrs. Joyce um, okay, where do we where do we have associate principals at all the middle schools all the middle schools the and the high school mm -hmm. the four middle schools the high school uh, Raymond and Davis and in the K to eights yeah we don't have associates in the elementary schools and we don't have it at the Asheville or the Pluff in the Asheville or Pluff okay so how are those roles <laughs> satisfied in those schools because there's testing in those schools mm -hmm. there's curriculum development mm -hmm. in those schools there's evaluation sure. in those schools so how would, how is that role handled in those schools. Um, I would say that as, as we were talking through the different um, responsibilities, the role of the instructional resource specialist and reading resource specialist mm -hmm. at those particular schools at the elementary level, as well as the instructional resource specialist that is at the PLUF and also at the Ashfield, takes on those responsibilities okay. with the exception of educator evaluation. Okay. Um, we are, to be perfectly honest, at a deficit because we only have two evaluators in each one of our elementary schools. and many, 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 many teachers to evaluate. And our associate principals are not members of the BEA? Correct. 
Okay, so they are serving the role as evaluators. I know in the past that was handled by assistant principals. And assistant principals still do evaluate. They still do evaluate. In those schools where associates exist, there are three people who take part in evaluations as well as district personnel who take part in evaluations. So it's a shared role. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know historically when, I remember when the associate principals were, that position was created. I think Buzz Nemberco mm -hmm. created that position. And I feel as though, and this is a personal comment, that there's always a bullseye. Every single year there's a bullseye on this position. And it's, it's really bothered me that it has because I think it's a valuable position within our system, especially in our middle schools and our K-8s. to eights. I think that you serve a critical role in curriculum development and making sure that what happens at the central administration trickles down to the classroom. Um, I read an article a, m a couple a month or so ago in the Globe where Boston Public Schools are criticized because there's a lack of, of um, trickle down of the curriculum to the school level. And I really believe that one of the reasons that we're not criticized and that our, our schools do so well is simply because you are in that play, in, in this role. And I will always support this position. I will never waver from that support. I think you're criti you serve a critical role and I think that we are better school district because of your role in the schools. I'd like to see associate principals in every single school. Um, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for those kind words. Um, I say that on behalf of our, our entire group. So we appreciate that. Thank you very and much. Thank you for the presentation for all of the new members. You're welcome. We have our principals here. So I, I see them up there. I know they're very proud of, and, and I have to say, and, and I'm sure it came across loud and clear, they're a team. And it is important with all of the mandates as you spoke about with at eval, with supporting students, English language learners, special education, teachers in the classroom. So many of these things, again, could not be done without the team effort that we have. And you know, when we talk about the associate principals, um, our assistant principals, our principals, they very much form a team to make sure that there's order in the classrooms, that the teachers have what they need, that the parents are welcomed into the school, all of these things are critical in, again, hiring a quality teacher. It's over a million dollar investment that we make every year in these new teachers that we bring on board. And our hope is that they remain f with us for a long time. But I do have to say this, and I love that you talk about equity because you've talked about it a couple of times tonight, Mrs. Joyce. It is about equity. And when we look at the middle schools, I think many of, whether it's Brockton High School, whether it's our elementary schools, sometimes we're very jealous of the schedule. You built a schedule in your middle schools where every day you have common planning time where teachers get together it's not free time you know you were shown the professional development piece all of the different things that go go into that job every day and this is something that we would like to see throughout the district it may be costly I know how difficult this budget is for all of us but I hope we're going to be moving in that area and when we put together your deputy superintendent of curriculum and instruction and you gave us two executive directors to oversee all of this work going on you know Granted, we've taken a step back even in that area, but we're going to continue to move forward, and uh, and we are very proud of the work they do, and hope that we can expand it, you know, throughout the district. So, thank you. Thank you. And as I said, I'd like to at some point, you know, bring on the uh, reading resource specialists, the instructional resource specialists, and let's hear about what their day is. And I think people will will better understand that than hearing about this in blogs. So I thank you. I think Mr. Petronio should come up, is, or do you need Can Mr. I start? Petronio? Yeah, sure. <laughs> One of the things that we had talked about was continually continuing to make budget on the forefront of, of everything that that we discussed this year because one of the things, uh, and I know you're getting this in your packet on Fridays, we're trying to give you uh, an update as to where we are, and although we have made a lot of progress, it is very frustrating to me when I hear people say, 
Well, well, we've moved forward. We've called back 199 of the teachers. You know, I need, and, and I know I'm not just bringing this to your attention, meaning the school committee, but to share with our audience and certainly the public in Brockton. Those 199 teachers came back at a great cost to the district. I met with the principal the other day, and everybody has been working so hard together, but the reality has set in. And a principal said to me, Kathy, do you realize the money that's been cut from the student budget to support you know, supplies, materials, textbooks? Yes, we do understand that. So I want people to hear that this has really gone deep into the core of many of our programs. And while I say that, I also want to say that we still have 70 members of our Brockton Public School employees that are still out on pink slips. We're starting to make some progress uh, on the list. Um, with our paras, we presently do not have uh, any paras that are remaining, and when I say on pink slips, for those that are involved with instruction in the classroom, which was your first priority. We do have 18 that still remain out with pink slips. They presently will remain on unemployment if there are needs, and you know what happens you know, with para needs. A special needs student moves into the district, needs a one-on-one. -on -one. We will immediately go to that list and again start to bring back those paras uh, that remain uh, on being uh, reduction in force. Our MTAs, we have three left that uh, are involved in classroom instruction, involved uh, with the classroom. Uh, we do have two that will remain out presently um, will not be called back at this time. We've eliminated those positions. Under our administrative assistance, we were at the number 12, we're down to 11. We did have one administrative assistant um, sign up for the early retirement. Our custodians and craftsmen, uh, 15 still remain out uh, with their pink slips, and we still have 19 of the parent liaisons, and that is somewhere uh, in the realm of, as I said, about 70 employees. You had given me permission at the last school committee meeting to spend up to $300,000. I think you've been able to see that that has been spent. If you look at the last page of what we presently have identified, from that money we have about a little over $11,000. We are continuing to work with uh, grants, uh, spending down grants, looking at what, what might be used to put towards bringing back positions, but presently we're, we're still awaiting word on grants coming in and any other efficiencies that we can continue to find. I also want you to hear of uh, some of the effects, and it was very interesting tonight to hear Mr. Is it Mr. Zaid? Yes. When Mr. Zaid spoke to you uh, about the facilities, and again, I talked about things being on the front burner. I am actually uh, invited to go before the City Council on uh, July 21st, Monday evening. A couple of things will be on there. We'll be on there to talk about the feasibility study for our uh, Mass School Building Assistance Funds. But in the meantime, I'm going to be doing a little bit of the State of the Schools Address. And I hope to do this at least four times during the school year, especially in light of what we have seen happen this past year. And one of the things that you'll hear me talking about, and I talked about it on June 9th, was not only um, talking about our organizational chart, which was a question that came to me on June 9th, also to talk about some of the, the jobs that we talked about this evening, uh, associate principals, what our assistant principals do, our reading resource specialists, to talk about our organizational structure. But I will be talking about the facilities. I will be coming up with a date in early fall, inviting them hopefully on a Saturday when you can all make it. I'll check with your calendars first. And we want to invite the city council to take a bus tour, to go and look at some of the conditions in these schools. You've heard us talk about modular classrooms. We're talking about when you brought up the, the Hancock School today. It is certainly a school that we are taking a look at. While I can't talk to a latch on a door, that's something that can easily be taken care of and needs to be, there are much much greater facility needs that we have and we need the city to see that to be able to support our facility master plan all of these projects that deputy superintendent thomas has spent hours on making sure that our district is put in a position where we can take advantage of the uh, help that the state is offering us so again budget will continue to be in the forefront i'm working with uh, jocelyn meek our communications director to work on that website so when people hear that 199 teachers are back in the district they need to see all of those other cuts we made, that we will continue to look for grants, continue to look for ways to bring those back, look at ways to, to talk about our facility needs. But more importantly, and what I want to share with you this evening, is when you have your um, parent information center and you have your 
your choice and we have done an excellent job in our city with allowing parents for many different reasons to choose schools, to choose them within zones. Sometimes a parent chooses an out of zone placement. Could be based on where they have a daycare. So these are the things I want to talk to you about, have how the budget has negatively impacted our children and will continue to negatively impact them. So I want to tell you a story of how you have a situation where every year we look at out of zone placements. And what we do is the parent fills out a form and we ask the parents simply, are you going to continue with the out of zone placement that we've allowed your child to have? Sometimes the child comes to us in a kindergarten class, and I'm going to use the Kennedy as an example, comes in the kindergarten, maybe it's a babysitting issue, the, babys the babysitter is grandma, it's a single parent family. The child has been there from kindergarten through fourth grade, sometimes in fifth grade. We are at a point right now, right now, a critical point, where when we sent these notes out to parents, we now have had to tell these out of zone parents in a number of the schools, because when we put in for 11 additional positions, because we were watching that growth come up. We knew they were coming from third grade to fourth grade. We knew that bubble was coming. We had planned for additional fifth grade teachers and had to cut that because of the budget just to bring back our 199 teachers. We're now sending notes to parents and I'm receiving phone calls saying to me, what do you mean my child can't remain at the Kennedy School out of zone? Well, the numbers in the classrooms are right now reaching 30. We haven't even hit the summer when people are starting to register and move into a neighborhood. And we're telling these parents that those children need to, we need to find another school in the district that might not quite have 30. They might have 25, 26, and those numbers will continue to grow. So I bring that up because I know we're meeting in policy. I think we need to take a look at some of these decisions because when a parent looks at me and says, is this educationally sound? My child has friends. You know, my child you know, has been successful academically in a school. They're part of that school. And we're telling them because the numbers at the George School, I believed we had some numbers in fifth grade that were reaching 39. So you are talking, we are in a critical position already where we need to, and this is clearly because of the budget. That's what I want everybody to hear. We put in for those positions. We planned ahead. We knew what was happening in those schools. So a couple of things here. I had talked about, and I'll be telling the city council the same thing, that on our website, you're going to continue, continually be able to see your school and the numbers of students in those classrooms. You'll be able to see the fourth grade, the fifth grade. We're already meeting to freeze classes at certain in districts and I will tell you today I, I was really upset I took a not took a ride I come down West Elm Street extension on the way to work every morning and was detoured this morning which pushed pushed me on to Center Street I hadn't been down there I don't know if any of you have seen that Trinity project going up when you look as I was stuck in traffic trying to get to the office all I could see were children's faces in those apartments that are not finished and they'll be finished soon enough and I want to know where those children are going. And we need to continue. Mrs. Joyce, you made, again, an excellent uh, discussion with the mayor when you said that we need to be sitting on some of those boards. We need to be hearing about projects that are planned in the city. As I said, we don't turn children away. We do an excellent job with them. But it's time for us to start to talk about the reality of what we're dealing with with this budget. I'm not sure if you're going to get phone calls. The letters just went out to the out-of-zone families. Uh, and we're getting uh, families that are concerned and they're upset and they have a right to be. But we have an obligation to take a look at class size for these children also. So that's kind of my update on the budget and uh, it's concerning. Any questions, comments? Okay. Next item, evaluation. Um, I think you've been given uh, one of my suggestions as we before we go on to our web-based program baseline edge eventually I know for this year you were going to be completing the evaluation on a, a summative sheet I gave you this as a sample it's what we're using for uh, all of our administrators and Mr. Mr. Minicello I will give you all of my folders um, my updates from when we last spoke I believe it was sometime in early May and uh, it gives you an opportunity to, to fill out the same kinds of sheets that, that we're using. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how you want to conduct that, but I'll present all the information I have with an update as to the end of the year. Okay. What, what I'll do is I'll, um, 
meet with you and then I will report back to the rest of the committee in terms of the logistics and the mechanism that we'll use to incorporate everything um, and then um, we will hopefully I don't know what everyone's vacation schedules are for the rest of the month, um, but perhaps by the next school committee meeting we can um, have all of the data accumulated. So, okay. In our next school committee meeting, August 12th, we also have um, a report of the district review and the strategic plan will be introduced. That's our timetable for the August 12th meeting. It'll be a busy meeting. Okay. Um, this is Joyce. Um, um, superintendent's report. On the 21st, you're meeting, you're presenting at the city council meeting. What time is that? I believe it's at... It's it 7? I think I brought it here. I'm sorry. I'm just... Mm. I'm sorry, I thought I had it here. I have it in my phone. It is right here. Uh, 7 p.m. Okay, uh, great. 21st in the council chamber. Great, thank you. When the city council will consider those items that the mayor uh, offered at the last school committee meeting? It should be. I'm pretty sure they were put in the last reading, so they would have been invited. Okay. Okay, so I would invite any of the school committee um, to attend that evening just in support, to show support for the superintendent in her presentation. So. Next items item. to refer to subcommittee. Um, we have uh, we need a finance subcommittee on uh, Chartwell's meal pricing, mm -hmm. and we also are looking for a transportation subcommittee to address our. Uh, we're holding off as long as we can. We're looking again for additional funds for for busing. We're moving some monies around. Um, Deputy Superintendent Thomas, you want to update us, or we'll just. Yeah, right now we were able to, um, we were down, uh, we were going to be down about nine buses. Uh, we were able to save, as you know, that's the same pot of money that the crossing guards come out of. So we were able to eliminate up to 30 crossing guard posts that we will make um, public before school opens so people know where they're not going to be crossing guards uh, starting in September, which saved us about 220000 that we switched over to be able to save four buses. So now uh, we would be down five buses from what, we're, what we currently ran this past year. Um, we're looking for to, um, a little bit more money so we can pick up another two, so it would only be down three, and I think we could get away with pretty much keeping the same services as last year uh, by redoing some routes and um, you know maybe unfortunately making a little, uh, some of the runs a little bit longer. Maybe um, a bus will have to go to a school, drop off, and then go to another stop up and pick up so um, it might you know there might be a few buses late for for schools but we we're able to transport as many kids as we did last year which is about 8,000 um, but I'd like to discuss that more in a transportation um, subcommittee meeting and also Mrs. Joyce you asked us to look into um, the pr maybe purchasing and looking into purchasing some vans and hiring some drivers to maybe do some of our homeless transportation to save some money there that was something you t we talked about last time talk about the impact on the, the hotel that's being designated as all exactly as yep. a as the one at Westgate, at the one at yeah. Westgate. And what impact that's going to have on us and the capacity of that hotel? Exactly, yep. Yeah, I'll um, actually um, visit the hotel myself before the meeting to make okay. sure the number of rooms and so what are you how many more kids we can pick up. Um, it would be some either the last week of July or the first week of uh, the August would be the best. Okay, do you want to possibly shoot for the first week in August? Who else is on that subcommittee with me? And Judy and Tom. Okay, and I'm sure many of the members of the committee would like to be on it. The major impacts on on our district. So maybe we can float around a couple of dates the first week of August and um, 
maybe um, Wanda can send an email to see what the availability would be. I know we have I um, impact bargaining going on, so I want to intrude on that. So maybe a Tuesday and Wednesday. So over the next week, we can finalize that. How's sure. That sound? Sounds okay. good. Okay, good. Do I have Wanda to get back to you on both dates for the Finance Subcommittee and Transportation? Try to do them on the same sure. night, or what would you? Or is that too much? Oh, and that's the only thing we have yeah. to do for finance? Sure. Why don't we do finance first then? So it doesn't get lost. The other thing that I, I would like to update you on the finance subcommittee is um, I have been working um, with Aldo Petronio. We're working, we told you, with UMass Donahue Institute. Uh, we're supposedly hearing from them very soon. Uh, we're looking for uniformity with principal contracts, looking at factors. Um, I'm going to be bringing the principals in later in July, waiting for this information uh, with both deputy superintendents. We're going to be talking about contracts, about budgeting, which we had talked about in February, about a different way of doing it. It's interesting to be doing FY15 now, but starting to talk about FY16. I still want to move forward with that. Uh, and also looking at our facility and building needs. So we'll meet as a team you know, with the principals, and I'll be reporting back to you uh, and that finance committee about, again, looking at contracts uh, in the district and some uniformity and hopefully some good suggestions. Mr. Henningsen. Yeah, um, so when we discuss the transportation bus, et cetera, could we also uh, look into the, the bus passes and explore that, that option and how that would work? And, and um, Because I think it's important that we make sure that the kids who are supposed to be getting the bus are getting the bus and we're not you know, uh, having a larger cost than we need to have. Yep. Yep. Thank you. It's ready. Can you provide us a list of the crossing guard posts that are being eliminated? Sure. Oh, yep. And I will have that at that meeting that night. Okay, that'd be great. Yep. Thanks. Great. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, new business. This is Joyce. Unfinished. Sorry. Oh, sorry. My eyes are unfinished business. Yeah. Well, I. We have a member, an MOA with the school police unit, the subcommittee of the school committee uh, came to an agreement for a one year um, contract. I do believe we have to vote on that this evening. Okay. Okay, so um, on June 20th, we came to an MOA for one year, a one year agreement from July 1st, 2013 to June 30th, 2014, which has actually already expired. We are continuing to negotiate a multi year contract with this group. But this one year memorandum, memorandum of agreement gets us through this one past year, and um, the language is included, I believe, is included in your packet, and we need to sign off on it this evening. They have already ratified the, um, the con the one year contract. Okay. Um, any um, questions? Oh, I thought I saw your arm go up. No? Okay. Um, do we need to have a motion? Mm -hmm. So did you is that was that in the form of a motion or did you want I'd to I'd like make to a entertain motion? a motion. Okay. Do you want to make the motion? I'll make the motion yeah. okay. to accept the memorandum of agreement with the Brockton Police Union uh, group for the period uh, commencing from July 1st, 2013 through June 30th, 2014. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Okay, great. So if everyone can sign it before you leave, that'd be great. Any other unfinished business? New business. Yeah, I was going to do that. I'd give the committee a chance. To. Anyone have any new business? Okay, seeing then, I have just an item. Um, I don't know if you guys recall, but um, we had discussed having uh, wellness come in for a presentation. Um, a particular concern is obviously what's going on with. Um, the issues regarding uh, drugs in our community and other communities and um, I wanted to again invite the wellness department to present to us the curriculum that deals with drug prevention 
what's introduced and um, taught to our students at all levels, what um, changes, if any, are being proposed to basically beef up that aspect of our health and wellness throughout the district because of you know what I think we all would recognize as an epidemic, especially heroin. Um, I really um, suggest that we have as many speakers and programs who uh, present information about you know personal uh, involvement and um, stories, uh, in interventions, uh, those type of uh, speakers come in and basically tell about you know the real life situations, the consequences, what they have gone through and or family members, the horrible impact um, that it has on families. Um, just because uh, you know we, we're picking up the paper every day and you know it's not just Brockton, it's everywhere. Um, I think if we are remiss about that and don't address it, we're doing our students and youth in the city a disservice. We, it's, it's a problem that we all need to acknowledge and deal with. So, you know, so Madam Superintendent, when you have an opportunity to schedule this with uh, your wellness department, um, I mean, I, I would really like to know, you know, what is being presented at what levels, um, you know, how the information is being presented, what, you know, is, if there's any new items being contemplated and implemented, what types of activities are involved. Um, is that okay? <laughs> Yes, and, okay, and as good. you mentioned, you know, it was something we were planning to do, I think, just before the budget. I know we had canceled yeah, we got one of the curriculum track. subcommittee meetings. Um, is Do we want this in a regular school committee meeting, or do we want to look at a subcommittee meeting? I, I, I think I think for the benefit of the public, I think it should be at a regular school committee meeting, so, okay. um, so that word gets out that, you know, the school committee, the district is serious about this, and um, it, it basically gets to the public, you know, what our plan of action currently is, what it may turn into, or, you know, what it, how it may be expanded. I think it's a sort of a public service topic that needs to be done in front of the key TV cameras for the benefit of the public so that they know that we are taking this seriously. We'll uh, certainly have, I know Dr. Tarasi, I spoke to him today, so his team is ready, and, but we'll com you know, continue to focus on this very aspect because you know, you're correct. I mean, I we're all seeing this, and, uh, and again, it isn't just the Brockton community, but it's certainly incumbent upon us to make sure that we're educating our children age appropriately as early as we can and you know, making sure that we're certainly not turning a blind eye to something that you know, our community is dealing with. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had discussions with my own children about it, and, you know, at the middle school level, you know, my one son tells me that, you know, he knows a group of kids that are, you know, on the first step, they're, you know, smoking pot. Now, you know, today, pot, there's so many mixed messages with marijuana usage, you know, in terms of the legalization, you know, and all that. But, I mean, I just think it's a road that, we need to go down and, and discuss with our students, with the public. I mean, so, you know, it, it's happening, hopefully not in the elementary level, but it's certainly, you know, drugs are being introduced at the, at the middle school level, and if we're saying they're not, we're kidding ourselves, because I'm hearing it firsthand that, you know, there's a number of kids that are doing it at that level, so. Um, Mr. Jordan. Quality, which is very high use on the South Shore. Um, we've seen the results of that recently. A number of children dying from that. It's, it's street name is Molly. Uh, used usually in clubs, but also was used amongst children. Um, I think you're too high when you say middle school. 
is actually at the elementary school level also, unfortunately. How far we want to go down, I'm not sure. How deep you go into it uh, may be a question. And maybe we could survey through the elementary schools to find out where we want to go with that, but it is at that level. Uh, it's very unfortunate that that's there. And two things, the what the law has changed when it comes to the use of marijuana and what does medical marijuana mean, which is two separate different things. Uh, and I think it's very confusing to all levels of folks out here. So just families don't understand it, children don't understand it. Um, those that have maybe used it in the past don't know what's legal or not. And not that I'm advocating anything, and I'm not. But it's the point of people understanding where things are right at this point in time, and maybe how soon something may happen since we are a selected city for this end of the world to have a marijuana um, dispensary, I thank you. So it'll be growth dispensary, there's a lot of things around that that we don't need to get into, security and some other things that are being done. But this, these are things that people don't understand, uh, I think at this point in time, and what that means. We're, we're hearing bits and pieces from other parts of the country, and that's not necessarily what's going on here in the Commonwealth. So. Well, I think what I'd like to do again is present to you what we're presently doing. Uh, let's talk about you know making sure that we're paying attention to, to educating our own children and families with things that are happening in our community and we can continue to have this dialogue. I mean, as you said, things are changing every day. But I'd like to at least begin with, with that discussion, which is what we were prepared to do originally. And we'll take a look. You mentioned speakers. Uh, you mentioned... Well, I just think speakers have an impact. You know, they, they, they get to the kids. I mean, even if it's, you know, the one speaker that comes in and you have the whole group in the auditorium, a whole grade at a time, I, I just think that hearing your teacher talk to you about the ills of drug use and having someone come in that is a motivated speaker who's telling people from their own personal uh, interactions, their own personal involvement, I think that has a huge impact on kids. Um, so. I forget how many years ago it was now, at least five, maybe more, maybe, I think it's longer than that now, maybe six or seven, when OxyContin came in, there were three students that had, that had gone to Brockton High School that spoke to, and, and there was a number of groups that were putting it together, but the DA's office, court system, I don't remember if schools were involved or not, I think they were, uh, it was held, I believe, in the audit, main auditorium. The impact of those three students who were middle class children, how, why, and what they were doing, I think it had more impact on individuals that saw that, I mean, witnessed that that particular evening than probably anything else that has come out. Because uh, that was really like most of our children. Was, you know, the was that the Wasted Youth series? It was before the, that, actually. Before that. Okay. I think it resulted in that series coming up. But the DA's office, I know, had a, a very heavy piece in that. And it, it, uh, they really explained what they did, how they got into it, how much it took. That was one of the questions I asked uh, to become addicted. It was very surprising how quickly that happened, which was, I think, instrumental for a lot of people who had no understanding of what this new drug was all about. Of which now, we have the third series that the governor just tried to stop, but was overturned by the, I believe it was the SJC, or it might even be, no, it, it was the federal government, I think, that stopped them from, yeah, and, and here we go again. So these are things that I think people need to know so they have some idea to be able to combat it from just a point of, as you say, discussing with children or family members or just for us to know what's going on and what these things are all about. So. Well, I, I think this is a good opportunity for the superintendent to talk to her um, department head about outreach. I think if you spoke to Mr. Jacobs over at the DA's office, he certainly would have resources in terms of exactly. people, um, organizations. If we speak to some of our social agencies in the city, I'm sure there's people and or organizations that do this and visit different districts and, and so so this is definitely sort of an outreach um, this is Peterson, uh, an outreach situation that we really I think need to take advantage of you know so um, 
I'll go with Ms. Clark first and then Mr. Henningsen and then Mr. Robinson. I would also like to see um, not just on the drug use side but also on paraphernalia identification and when kids are taught that. I know there's been lots of incidents lately with hypodermic needles and other paraphernalia that's been found at playgrounds or even just doing yard cleanup. I had a situation several weeks ago where that happened. So. Um, teaching kids, you know, unfortunately at a younger and younger age, what to look for, what not to touch, and what to do in a circumstance when you're brought into contact with that, I think is um, something we should look into as well. You're absolutely right. I mean, the kids go to the local parks, and we all know that in some areas, someone could leave something like that, and a kid is going to be a kid mm -hmm. and pick it up, and what are they going to do? They're going to play with it yeah. if they don't, you know, know the severity of what it could have. Um, are you all set? Yep. Mr. Henningsen and then Mr. Robinson. I would also encourage reaching out to uh, the Brockton Police Department and Officer Liedberg on her program and not my kid. You know, um, I had an opportunity to attend one of those sessions with Mrs. Sullivan actually, and it was incredibly informative. Actually, Superintendent Smith was there as well, and we actually had a speaker that was. Uh, I don't think there was a dry eye in the room. Um, it was a an ER nurse um, who was. Um, whose ex-husband is a Brockton police detective. And you know, you would expect that they would catch all of this and they had no idea about their their, their kid, you know, on substances and, and it was just it was a it was a sad situation. So I would encourage, you know, that would be a possible great speaker, uh, to, to talk to uh, even the, the children to understand from a parent's perspective what parents go through when they see their kids uh, go through these issues, not just, you know, the mentor situation of, you know, uh, somebody saying I was an addict or whatever, but also from a, a parent or family perspective on what it does and how it tears a family apart. I, I didn't want to cause a, a kumbaya session, but, <laughs> but all I'm saying is I think there's more that we can do and it's yes. an issue that we need to we need to show some direction and some leadership on. That's all. Mr. Robinson. Um, be happy. Um, Superintendent Smith, if, if you'd like to talk, this is in part what I do professionally, um, is working with mostly the, the state-funded prevention organizations around substance use, uh, prescription drug overdose, um, opiate overdose, and uh, underage drinking right now are currently the primary funded ones, but also tobacco, um, which, believe it or not, is increasing again amongst our young people, especially smokeless tobacco. Um, so I'd be happy to connect the district to some resources in terms of speakers um, and there are a lot of Massachusetts is ahead of the curve on this um, especially the opiate overdose issue um, but there isn't there's a lot of emerging best practices there isn't a lot of established best practice um, in the state of Massachusetts or nationally around these issues um, but there are a handful of school districts who are experimenting with curriculum um, other early identification programs um, things like that. Um, I've been working through the Trauma Advisory Board, which, which does our, our schools, and I don't know if the school committee has noticed, but in our weekly packets, um, we've started getting some information on um, suspensions and referrals to supportive services and things like that. Um, I've been trying to work with Dr. Tarasi and a few other people to kind of parallel the information we get about class sizes and, and you know, scores and tests and all that stuff with some of the social emotional um, indicators whether it be from our nurses office or whether it be from uh, our suspensions and referrals uh, ambulance calls other things um, and we're kind of trying to identify in the district what might be some appropriate indicators that would help us uh, be more aware of how these problems are ebbing and flowing and emerging in our schools and so um, you know I think we'd be remiss to say too that um, we have probably some really good students great students 
students who would never touch a substance because of the damage that they've seen it done um, either to a parent or an older sibling or to another family member um, and so the education that we uh, should be thinking about as well is not just about not using substances but how to uh, how to seek resources within your own school how to create safe and supportive environments uh, who you can talk to in your school if you have a parent or a, a sibling who you know about I mean there's a this is an endless topic but but I think you know not, not to get too deep into it tonight but I'd be happy to and I meet with um, Ed Jacobs on a, on a pretty regular basis the city is looking at the city has currently three different grants to, to from from the Department of uh, Public Health and and um, the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services to, su to support prevention efforts um, and, and I work with all three of them um, as well as some of my colleagues um, but I've been talking to um, the district attorney's office about supporting additional uh, application for resources as well um, and so you know I'd be happy to help however I can why don't I uh, put together dr. Tarasi Mary Ellen Corain I'll talk to uh, principal Walder we'll talk about uh, our high school piece uh, we did have Nick Lee in that position that was a position that we cut right now we're looking for ways to to support the high school um, so we can put together that team and we'll invite you to come in and have some conversation with us sure it'd be yeah. a big help thank you I'll have one to follow up with that just set up the meeting and follow up with that anyone else okay any other items no need for an executive session so to motion to adjourn anyone gonna second it all right all in favor adjourn thank you